Our next speaker is Marcus Lowe. He's a senior advisor to the Civil Society Coalition. Um, thank you very much, and thank you very much to Pranesh for, uh, I think, an excellent um, talk. And so, I was at university in the late 90s, um, and at that point, some books were available to me in accessible ebook formats. That's the late 90s. Now, if some books could have been available to me then in accessible formats, I don't see why all ebooks could not have been available to me then in accessible formats. So, that was 15 years ago. And as we've heard time and time again, only about 1% of books are available in accessible formats in developing countries. So, this is a problem we can solve. We've had the means to solve it for years. As I say, if I could have one, if one book could be made accessible to me 15 years ago, you know, it should, it should be close to 100% now. And the reason for, for this shameful failure to make books accessible to blind people is a failure on behalf of the publishing industry. There's no way of denying this. They simply haven't cared enough to make books available to blind people. So, when any publisher tells you that, you know, they would like the market to solve this problem and, you know, we shouldn't prevent that from happening, I think that's complete nonsense. And that's, that's been the story of my life. They've had years to solve it and they failed. We wouldn't be here in Marrakesh and they, you know, care even a little more about blind people. I mean, this is not rocket science making a book accessible. So, with that thought in mind, I think it's absolutely appalling to what extent um, certain delegations, specifically the United States and the European Union, have let themselves, have let their positions be dictated by these publishers who have a clear track record of you know, not seeing blind people as a priority. So I think that's absolutely shameful. And I think the US delegation and the EU have shown very little moral backbone on these issues. Um, so that's the first part of my rant. Um, sorry. Um, so secondly, I think it's important to see this in a, in a broader kind of historical and political context. Um, and it is very interesting that it's, it's essentially highly rich developed countries that are opposing the progressive aspects of this treaty. So, for example, it's the EU who are um, objecting to language around translation. And when you consider that most of the world's blind live in developing countries, many of whom were colonized in the past and had languages enforced upon them. For the EU now to, you know, play hard on translation is, it's, it's quite distasteful to me. And given the historical legacy and the fact that many blind people in, in poor countries in South Africa, you'll, you know, you'll find lots of English books in Braille, but English is, might be your third language. So, I think there's a lot of hypocrisy, um, you know, up in public, people say very nice things, but as we all know, the negotiators um, act at a very different level, and they don't live up to their lofty rhetoric. So, while listening to the negotiations a few days ago, um, I, it, was, it was like watching a chess match where my future is being, you know, where my future is in balance. It had that feeling about it. But what disturbs me about that is that, you know, it has, the, the way we talk about a lot of these things has, it has the feeling of a game. It's like, I trade you this for that. It's like you're playing poker or something. Um, and I, as we evaluate the different proposals and what's on the table, in the, you know, now and for the next day or so, 
I beg that you don't think of it in, in those reductionist terms. This is my, my life that you're talking about. It's my future. Um, and every time we compromise on a key issue, you know, we're compromising on the future of my future and other blind people. So, you know, that's why we need to have you know, the red lines that are there must be set by blind people, not by the publishing lobbies who have failed us. So, just one other issue I want to touch on briefly is that um, at the moment, the issue of distribution to individuals is quite, is, you know, it's being discussed. Uh, my understanding is that there, um, some groups are seeking a compromise where you know, they'll allow distribution to individuals in other countries, but only if there's um, increased accountability um, on the exporting authorized entities. Now, that is a, a typical case of something that, would, that is essential in poor countries. Um, if you're in Swaziland, you know, you probably don't, you don't well, Swaziland doesn't have an authorized entity. So, the only way you can distribute books there is if you distribute to individuals. Um, and to put onerous um, of, you know, red tape um, on exporting authorized entities will, you know, has the potential to completely make that system unworkable. So, um, I think I've gone on too long, but I, I really just want to leave you with this thought that when you evaluate these suggestions and these deals that are put on the table that you must consider it in that light. You know, if this treaty doesn't help someone in Swaziland, is it really, really worth it? And just as a final word, I think simply having a treaty is nothing to celebrate. Um, you know, I, I'm certainly not going to be happy if it's, a, if it's a poor treaty. I think it's better to have no treaty than a poor treaty. Thank you very much. Um, I think you've made an excellent point that we have been hearing a lot of discussion about trading one thing for another. And I was wondering if you could perhaps um, discuss some of your concerns about any specific issues that you're concerned could be traded off. Well, it's, it's very hard to anticipate what, what they're going to throw at us. Um, as I said, the one thing I know about is these, this increased accountability um, well, accountability is the wrong word. What they're looking for is red tape and a way to to really pressurize authorized entities into limiting what they do. Um, it's, it's a means of control. Um, and I guess just a broader point I'd like to make on this is that a lot of what we're getting from the publishing industry and therefore the US is, is kind of broad copyright principles that they want to see um, repeated in this, in this treaty. And essentially I feel <coughs> they're taking a sledgehammer approach to something that we need to deal with quite um, intricately. They're doing surgery with a sledgehammer, essentially. Um, there, there's a number of other key issues. You know, I wouldn't want to lose the fair use language in the text. I think that's essential. Um, I think interoperability has to stay um, and then I obviously agree with everything Pranesh uh, said and Marianne. I think those, you know, we're all on the same page about that. Um, and the other key issue, just to mention briefly, is that um, I think it's unacceptable that audio-visual works have been excluded from this treaty. And to understand there are ways being looked at now at how we can reintroduce it, um, even if it is only in a limited way. Um, but if there are trade trade-offs, you know that's the kind of thing that that we should be putting on the table, and that's um, you know I think I think we stand. There's a risk that at the last minute the kind of um, U.S. and E.U. may put forward a bunch of much more aggressive um, proposals and try to leak it at the last moment. And I think it's good to have um, our kind of Things like audio video to trade with, um, if it comes to that. Hopefully not. Though. As I said, you know, we should 
we've already given away too much. We should be setting the red lines, not, not the other side. Um, well, just to add my bit to that last, the last topic, um, I, I don't really see why the EU has such a big problem with um, their limited translations that you know, we'd like the treaty to allow. Um, given that, you know, we're not going to translate a book if it's already been translated into that language. We won't, we're not stupid enough to go through all that trouble. <laughs> so, you know, it's translating for a market that you're not serving. So that's the first point. I don't, I don't get why that's such a big deal. And it's for the exclusive use of visually impaired people. So, you know, I'm, I have no idea why, why the EU is so upset about this. Um, so, yeah, just abusing the um, privilege of speaking. <laughs> I, I just want to kind of re-emphasize what I said earlier, that when you co as you consider the deals that are put on the table over the next few days, um, just please consider that this is, this is not a game. These kind of trade-offs that um, some negotiators come and sell to you as, you know, we'll do this and you do that. There's some, something morally repugnant about the way that's playing out to me. And, you know, I think this is, part of what's happened here is this, this is a human rights treaty being negotiated in a copyright setting. Um, and, you know, I, we need to remember that this is about, about real people and real lives and most of the people in the developing world. And most of the people poorer than all of us here with kind of hardly any, you know, any professional or educational prospect. So, you know, I beg of all of you to show some humanity and when you speak to delegates to urge, you know, urge them to, show, you know, act like human beings, not like uh, kind of cynical, um, you know, people who just don't believe in, you know, that good things can be done anymore. Thank you very much. <laughs>